Welcome everyone to FarmCast for the Community. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Brown. As you know, over the last several weeks, we've been really working hard to bring in a lot of different professionals talking about everything that we're going through in our community with regards to COVID. In addition, we've really been trying to hone in on educating the public and talking a bit about what we know to be truth versus fiction. Um, this is all sponsored by the University of Georgia's College of Pharmacy. And today, I actually get a chance to welcome Dr. Michael Welton, who's a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UGA. I'm telling you this because his primary research is actually takes place in Puerto Rico and deals a great deal with the Zika virus that we all heard about years ago and its impact on infants and small children. At the UGA College of Public Health, Dr. Welton teaches graduate level epidemiology courses, as well as supervising their practice, research, and mentorship and ep epidemiology work group. See how hard that is to say, epidemiology. So Dr. Welton, welcome. And as you can see, I stumbled with the word epidemiology. And I think that's because a lot of people are kind of like, what the heck does that mean? Can you define the word epidemiologist for us? Give us a bit of a background. I mean, your credentials are amazing, but how does that relate to this whole viral thing that's going on? Uh, yeah, of course, I, I can talk about epidemiology. First, thanks for having me, Tim. I, I, I'm sure. really happy to be on the show or on the, the podcast and talk about epidemiology and uh, coronavirus. Um, so epidemiology, I'll give you the definition I, we give to our students, or my uh, short and sweet definition is uh, the distribution and determinants of disease. We're interested in the three, three Ds. Uh, so that's uh, the distribution, where is the disease, the determinants, what are the risk factors, and, and the, the characteristics that help disease spread, and, and of course, uh, disease, uh, uh, the, the state of not being well, or just, uh, absence of health. So, you know, I look at this and I realize that I, I come to this game a bit late because I'm learning how much epidemiology plays a significant role in what we're looking at today in this pandemic. And I, I think it hits home more so than ever before. But we look at things like viruses and bacteria and, and those infectious agents like you were talking about. This is a virus. This is, you know, a coronavirus that we've been talking about that. But I hear other people talk about strep throat and I get a bacterial infection. What's the difference between a virus infecting me and a bacteria infecting me? I know you track both of those, but what makes them different, if you will? So, so in, in, in a lot of ways, uh, when you worry about becoming sick from a virus or a bacteria, they, they may be the same. Uh, uh, but I'll start with differences. Bac bacteria are living creatures, are, are living organisms. They uh, have a lifestyle, life cycle, they have a metabolism, they need food, they are, uh, uh, they, they, they're born or created and, and they die. Uh, a virus is not, a, a virus is minuscule uh, in, in size in comparison to a bacteria. And in fact, a virus uh, can be, uh, uh, can infect uh, bacteria. Uh, maybe uh, an appropriate analogy or metaphor is uh, uh, a virus could be considered just like a tiny, tiny microchip. It's a, it's a little piece of information surrounded by uh, a, a fatty membrane. Um, and so does, I know bacteria can live on surfaces for a little while, but really not that long. It seems like in all this talk about coronavirus, we've been talking about how long it lives on a package or how long it lives on a surface. Do viruses tend to live longer um, if I touch something or if I spray it in the air than maybe say a bacteria would? Yeah, so I don't, I don't wanna uh, get too, too into the weeds about living and, and not living. What, what a vi that being said, what a virus is doing is when it is on that surface is not degrading. Um, and so it's, uh, it, it is not degenerating. Um, and, and so it, I don't know that it, it stays longer or, or is it able to infect longer. There, there's several things that go into its ability to infect. Uh, so when you, uh, so again, the, the virus is a piece of DNA, a protein that, that's surrounded by a fatty membrane. And so what we want to do to, to get to that virus is degrade that fatty membrane. So things like dish soap, things like alcohol can penetrate that surface 
and and get to uh, get to ultimately destroy that virus and and the, and interrupt its ability to uh, to get in the human human body and replicate. So it has to get in the human body to replicate. It has to like jump. It has to have that host, if you will. So when I pick it up off the doorknob, that's when it become excuse this term become more active, if you will. Cor- correct. It has to invade a healthy cell, and it programs that healthy cell to re- reproduce with the the virus's uh, genetic characteristics. So bacteria can sort of do that on their own without me, but the virus needs me to have that occur, basically. Yeah, the the, the bacteria will will need something. It, it'll need something to to consume and and to grow and be healthy. Sure. Uh, which right, which which can be you, which can be something in the soil, which can be something, uh, oh, uh, some other or organic matter. Um, so when we look at this particular virus, though, you know, a lot of people have been talking about what makes it different. Is it unique? Those things. I think we're most familiar with the flu virus. I think we had to talk about another virus that we all watch out for every year. How is this one different than a flu virus or an influenza? They're both viruses, but it seems like this one is a little different in the way it either infects or the complications. Is am I understanding that correctly? The the biggest difference between uh, this coronavirus, uh, influenza virus, uh, rhino virus, para influenza virus, uh, etc., is 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 it's new. It's absolutely new. Our body has not seen it at all. There is not a speck of immunity in 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 humans to to combat this this virus of course there's no vaccine we don't have a treatment uh the biggest the biggest difference between this and other virus and in terms of uh trans transmission and uh its ability to uh uh spread is it's new uh we haven't seen it so in other words you know it's because our body has been attacked by something brand new that doesn't know what to do with or we don't have weapons, if you will, like we do with the flu virus. Correct. Uh, uh, correct. We as individuals don't have, uh, aren't prepared to, to fight it. And we as a population, uh, so we hear about herd immunity and that's uh, kind of the composite immunity put together uh, or that's brought together by uh, uh, groups of people. And, and, and we don't, we're zero. We don't have anything. Got it. So when I hear herd immunity, you know, I grew up on a farm, a cattle farm to be exact. So I hear herd, I think of a bunch of cattle together. You're saying that when a bunch of people get together, we kind of pass, if one's immune, we can pass our immunity to the next person over time, you know, because we've been exposed. Is that a fair statement? It's a little, it's, it's a little bit different. It's if you have a, a certain portion of the population that is immune, if you go out to the shopping mall or if you go out to the movies and a certain portion of the, uh, of the population in that movie theater is immune, the chance of passing that on is reduced. So if half of the people are immune in the movie theater, you sit down next to two random people, uh, it, 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 it's likely that your chance of passing that on has been, been cut in half. Got it. So, okay. So I need to be around people who've been exposed, but yet in the past two months, we've had a shelter in place and this whole term of flattening the curve, it seems like you'd want me to go out and get the virus so I could get immunity. But so why did we do shelter in place? Uh, What was the the take home message behind that? Uh, You know, we are trying to buy time. We are trying to, to buy time to get in place Tools that tools that we can use to fight the virus and cope with the, the health outcomes as a result of the virus. Um, so the biggest problem with uh, COVID nineteen, the, the the disease resulting from uh, this coronavirus, is the inundation of the health uh, the healthcare providers. Uh, our hospitals, our nurses are not able to to appropriately deal with the in, influx of, of new cases. And so what we're trying to do by flattening the curve is buy ourselves a little bit of time, uh, preferably a lot of time. Um, what, we, what we need, tools that may become available to help us combat the coronavirus uh, or COVID-19, uh, currently 
testing is uh, we are we aren't getting testing in place. Hopefully, we're making steps in the right direction with with adequate numbers of testing. Uh, we are working on a vaccine. Vaccine is going to take a long, long time. They they estimate 18 months is is maybe the fastest uh, 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 vaccine uh, could be created. Maybe they'll be able to fast track something, but 18 months is the estimate. Um, simple uh, protective uh, equipment, uh, uh, PPEs, face mask, gloves, uh, gowns, etc. We don't we don't have that stuff available for uh, for our nurses, for our healthcare providers, for our for our doctors. If you were to go on Amazon, I don't last year you would have been able to pick up a, a box of uh, N95 masks for a few dollars. If you go on Amazon right now, you simply can't buy N95 right. masks. So uh, what I hear you saying is by staying in place, we're not necessarily killing the virus. We're not getting rid of the virus. What we're doing is we're buying time so we reduce the transmission so our healthcare professionals can fight this thing and researchers can find a way, if you will, to, to kill it um, or stop it from moving around. Is that, is that pretty much what we've been doing for the last two months? Yeah, that's that's uh, a, a good summary of what we've been trying to do. The the prognosis for a, a COVID nineteen patient with adequate medical care is is good. If there are ventilators available, if uh, nurses and doctors have time to spend with that patient and and give them adequate care, you you have a very very good chance of having a, a complete recovery from COVID nineteen. Yeah. Uh, we're, when, hearing from, we're hearing from professionals like pharmacists, physicians, nurses, physician assistants, nurse practitioners about the hours they've been working and those things. So this buys a bit of time. I think the, the question, though, is we're raising this shelter in place. There's been a huge discussion about reopening states, and I'm not going to walk down that path, but I mean, the fact of the matter is we're going to have to leave our home at some point. So by leaving our home, does that increase the possible transmission of this virus again? Is there a chance that we could have more times in which we see a peak of the virus versus this one peak that everybody's talking about? Could there be another curve, if you will? Yeah, yeah. So un unfortunately for, um, for us, uh, COVID-19, uh, we're probably stuck with it for, for a, a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, every, every year there are uh, four corona four coronaviruses that circulate endemically that that cause uh, let's 35 30 35 percent of the the common colds and and that those coronaviruses are around and, and every year you can count on them them being there uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of expert experts predict that this will be the fifth coronavirus that we will have this next year we will have this the following year, we will have this the year after that. Um, as far as leaving your ha home this week or next week, no, there's there, nothing miraculous happened last week that, that stopped the risk of the, the uh, transmission. Um, and in fact, uh, the opposite, I've had some pretty serious uh, conversations with my mom and her husband uh, who are both uh, my mom's uh, in her 60s and he's in his 70s. And, uh, and the, the risk might be a little bit elevated as the, the risk of transmission is probably elevated as uh, the restrictions are, are loosened, as people start to emerge, as I, you know, we're not, everybody's has their fingers crossed that this is an appropriate time to, to reopen the, reopen the economy, reopen uh, the activities. I mean, I know that's the debate. I guess, in your opinion, and only your opinion, if we were trying to get ahead of the virus, when do you think that will happen? I mean, do you think it'll be 18 months, or do you think this time, this, this flattening of the curve that we've done already buys us time to really help the folks in the future when they become infected versus the folks that were infected early on when we didn't really have a lot of uh, resources? Yeah, so that's you know that's the million billion or trillion dollar question. I I I'm that's uh, and and again or uh, 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 above my my pay grade. We need to get tools in place. We need treatment. We need testing. Uh, 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 vaccine would be great. A, a 
treatment would be great. Um, hopefully, you know, I, I hope that this, this summer uh, things cool down a little bit and uh, in the fall, when there is a, a reemergence, uh, we are better prepared to, to handle it. So, you know, I guess as we talk about this, it's important not to really emphasize as we reopen up and look at herd immunity, because I really think that's a good point that you're making, but also we're not out of danger. We still need to be cautious about what we do and how we do it. Um, it keep ourselves safe and the ones we love safe as well. Is that fair while trying to be as normal as possible? And I use that word really loosely, normal. But as we come to an end here, Dr. Welton, um, and by the way, everyone, I speak with Dr. Michael Welton, who is an epidemiologist and is kind enough to come on and talk to us today about viruses, how they spread, what they do, those kinds of things. We're ending our time together, but do you have three pearls you'd like to leave with the community from what we've talked about today? Uh, yeah, I can, uh, I can come up with uh, three, uh, three pearls or, or, or three bullets. Um, uh, maybe the, the first is uh, uh, you're, not, you're not powerless to, to combat COVID infection, or you're not pow powerless to combat uh, uh, COVID-19. Follow, uh, follow pretty simple guidelines. Wash your hands, limit your contact, um, limit, limit, uh, touch it, limit uh, touching your face, um, and, and you should, should be okay. Uh, you should be able to pre prevent uh, infection. Um, so that's, that's one. Uh, be, you know, be informed, but, or, but don't panic. Um, number two, I don't think we've touched on this, but a healthy immune system is one of the best ways to prevent the negative outcomes of coronavirus. Uh, healthy people, there are outliers, but healthy people really, really fare better uh, with a coronavirus infection. So uh, it, take, a, take a second to think about uh, small changes in your lifestyle that you can, uh, that you can make uh, changes. So eating a healthy diet, getting exercise um, are things that will help boost your immune system, uh, which is great, uh, great for combating uh, uh, COVID-19 infection. Um, and last, let's see, three pearls. Uh, again, with uh, I, 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 there's no need to panic. Uh, I, read the news. Uh, read the news. Don't uh, watch the news. Uh, and make sure you check out uh, the the sources that your news comes from. So don't just read the title, uh, but really open it up and, and see where this information is coming from. Um, so. Keep being safe. Don't do anything crazy. Uh, also, immune system. Think about all the healthy things that can do, including getting your sugars under control, your blood pressure under control, those things. So don't stop your medications. And lastly, make sure you watch people who know what they're talking about, like you, Dr. Welch. Correct? <laughs> yeah, make, make friends with your, your local epidemiologist. <laughs> Thank you for your time today. I want to tell our folks once again that I'm talking with Dr. Michael Welton. He's an epidemiologist here at the University of Georgia. He's one of the leaders, and we worked with him in the past for many things in the College of Pharmacy. This partnership has been great for us because he keeps us tuned in to what's been going on. Dr. Welton, thank you for your time, and thanks for being with us. And I know you're busy as heck with research, but I really appreciate you taking time out of your teaching and the research to speak with our community today. Thanks for having me, Tim.